All of you will be familiar um, with the koh i n o which, uh, uh, as we just heard, is widely believed to have been stolen from India uh, by looting colonials. Uh, but what some of you may not know is that uh, it should specifically, but for a quirk of fate, be sitting in this state. Uh, when Ranjit Singh uh, was on his deathbed, he left it. Specific instructions uh, that his most uh, highly prized possession should go to the Jagannath Temple in Puri. Uh, and <laughs> well, the Rajat Singh, absolutely. And uh, this uh, was the written instruction uh, that he left as he was dying. Sadly, however, for all of you. Um, and, for, and indeed, specifically, sadly, for Arisa tourism, um, his treasurer had other ideas and believed that the Kohinoor belie- belonged to the k a l s a as a whole uh, and was not Ranjit Singh's um, personal property to gift outside the kingdom. And so, as Ranjit Singh lay dying of a series of strokes, uh, the uh, treasurer b e l a m i s i Ram hid the diamond. Uh, and only after the uh, uh, cremation of Ranjit Singh did it reappear and was given to his son. Uh, so I think the state could still mount a legal action uh, against Her Majesty in person uh, to to get the uh, diamond back. And I think you would have a very strong legal claim. There's uh, absolutely no question that this was where Ranjit Singh wanted it to go. And uh, the Sikh sources are unanimous about this. There are very few things that are certain about the Kohinoor, as you will hear in the next 40 minutes. Uh, but that it should have gone to a r i s a is 100% certain. So uh, uh, that's why I've chosen to speak about this subject today. Um, if you were to put in a claim uh, against Her Majesty for this diamond, uh, you would be the seventh uh, legal entity uh, to put in such a claim against the uh, the British Crown, uh, because while everyone in this country knows that, of course, the diamond almost certainly came from this country. Uh, almost certainly from the Golconda mines, um, uh, which of course is not actually the Golconda fort. It's the uh, the uh, estuary uh, down um, the Godavari estuary down uh, near Guntur, uh, where the uh, panning for diamonds used to take place in the alluvial sands of the Godavari. Um, but uh, uh, as well as India. Uh, the first legal claim to have this diamond returned actually came not from India at all, but from Pakistan. Uh, and Mr. Bhutto, uh, during the long drought of 1976, put in a legal claim to Jim Callahan, asking for the return of the diamond to Lahore on the basis that uh, Lahore was where it was most closely associated with, and Lahore was now in Pakistan. Therefore, Pakistan's claim uh, was uh, was preeminent. This was, of course, immediately resented by Bangladesh, who put in a, a second legal suit. Uh, India was third uh, on the uh, on the act. By the end of 76, there were three legal claimants. Uh, 1977, Iran joined the fray because, as uh, you will all know, I'm sure, uh, Nadia Shah took the diamond from Delhi to uh, to Tehran, uh, and uh, the Iranians believe it's theirs. As do the Afghans, because from Nadia Shah, it ended up in the hands of Ahmed Shah Durrani. Uh, and there it remained, only only five claims uh, until uh, shortly before 9/11, Mullah Omar put a, a claim in on behalf of the Taliban. Uh, um, everyone thinks they know the history of the Kohinoor, and it's of course one of the most famous pieces uh, of uh, uh, Indian, uh, uh, one of the most famous Indian artifacts in the world, uh, but. Like so much of the history of this country, and so much of the more contentious elements of the history of this country, uh, it is one of those objects which has generated, shall we say, more heat than light. Uh, and the actual facts of the Kohinoor are surprisingly hard to come by. And uh, the book that I wrote, co-wrote with uh, the wonderful Anita Anand, 
I, a Brit living in India, I need to Anand, an Indian living in Britain, uh, to try and find some measure of balance uh, through this uh, uh, difficult minefield. Um, we were provoked to write it by an extraordinary statement made by the Solicitor General to the Lok Sabha shortly before a visit of Theresa May. I'm sure there's absolutely no connection between the two. Uh, when he stated, to the surprise of everyone, including the Brits, that um, the Kohinoor had not been looted, uh, that it was given legally by Ranjit Singh to the British, and therefore was not a, there was no grounds for, uh, uh, for uh, restitution. Now, this was an extraordinary statement by any, uh, uh, by any grounds and took everyone by surprise, but anyone who actually knew the history of the diamond, um, as Anita and I had done, because we'd both been writing about it in our previous books, knew for a fact that the diamond did not make its way into British hands until 12 years after Ranjit Singh died. So if he had given it to the British, he could only have done it through a Ouija board or through astral projection or some mystical method uh, beyond the known means of known science. Uh, and uh, it was quite clear that in actual fact, the Solicitor General, like many people, had no idea of the actual history of the diamond. And if you were to look at any of the previous articles or books about the, uh, the uh, Kohinoor, you would find that there is a long chain of... Um, what's the word, uh, sort of, you know, past the parcel with the Kohinoor from dynasty to dynasty, uh, a history which, it turns out, has its origin in a document written for Lord Dalhousie, the British Governor-General who took the diamond, uh, and he commissioned a young British civil servant, one of your predecessors, uh, the, in, the, in what uh, preceded the, uh, the uh, IAS, um, to write a history of the diamond. He went, and this young man, Thomas Metcalf, went around the Red Fort because the Mughals were still there in the fort at the time of 1840s. And he went around the jewelers in Chandy Chowk and he gathered the gossip. But what he gathered was, of course, just that, gossip. Because the diamond had left Delhi 100 years before, at the time of Nadir Shah and Muhammad Shah Rangila in the 1730s. And actually, no one had any clue about the history of the diamond. And the series of events that Metcalf put together, which has become the authentic version in most histories of this stone, goes something like this. The diamond was mined in bottomless antiquity in the Golconda mines. It found its way into the eye of an idol of the Kakatiya dynasty uh, in what's now Andhra Pradesh. Uh, Whence it was looted by the wicked Kalji iconoclasts who swept south uh, under uh, the, the generals of Kalji, uh, who seized it, smashed the idol, brought it back to Delhi. It then passed from the Kaljis to the Tukluks, from the Tukluks to the Lodis, from the Lodis to the Mughals, uh, from, and from the Mughals it remained in the Mughal uh, uh, treasury until the useless Muhammad Shah Rangila, busy with his courtesans and his music and his dancing girls, um, uh, hid it in his turban when, Rand when Nadia Shah came to, uh, came to stay, shall we say. Uh, and uh, sadly, however, Muhammad Shah Rangila and Nadia Shah were sleeping with the same celebrated courtesan called Nurbai. And uh, according to the legend, uh, in the course of pillow talk, she let slip to Nadir Shah the hiding place of the diamond. So just as he was leaving, Nadir Shah said to Muhammad Shah Rangila, my brother, thank you so much for your hospitality. It's been lovely coming to stay and take all your jewels with me. Um, a catch, as a measure of our brotherhood, let us swap turbans. And so it was, according to this legendary series of events, that the, the, the Kohinoor found its way to Persia. Now, every single detail of that series of events, which you'll find repeated over and over and over again, as if it is fact, is in fact, to use a technical term, bollocks. Uh, there is absolutely no historical basis for any of those facts. And over the next half hour, I'll try and give you uh, an alternate version, which perhaps less glamorous, but uh, more, at least has the merit of being uh, factually verifiable. So first of all, it should be said that until the discovery of the New World Mines in Brazil and South Africa in the 1730s, all the diamonds in the world came from India. All the diamonds in the world 
came from India. It was one of India's first big exports. It went, uh, we know that uh, Indian diamonds had found their way as cutting tools into China uh, by the first millennium BC. Uh, they had possibly found their way to Egypt, and there are some scholars who believe that pyramids were actually cut uh, with Indian diamond-tipped instruments, because uh, even in earliest antiquity, everyone knew that diamonds were the hardest uh, substance in the natural world. And um, they spread later as objects of beauty. By the time of the Romans, uh, Indian diamonds were being traded through Afghanistan, through Hellenic Afghanistan. Afghanistan at that stage, not a, a, a sort of a Taliban free-for-all, but instead this gorgeous Gandharan center full of Buddhist monasteries, Hellenic civilization where Indic and Greek currents meet uh, in those early images of the Buddha and so on. And out of that culture come some very early rings that one can see in the British Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of New York with lovely dolphin bezels um, rising to an uncut, natural, octahedral diamond splinter. And a natural diamond, in the years before cutting of diamonds became mastered, is a tall, thin cylinder. Not the flat thing we're used to today uh, in diamond rings and so on, symmetrical, glittery. Uh, they were hard, octahedral cylinders that are attached often to a gold bezel. Uh, and they're like little kind of miniature pencils, if you like, a centimetre tall or half a centimetre tall, depending on the size. And these are things that people would pan for, not dig. So again, this image of ancient slaves with pickaxes in catacombs of mines beneath Golconda has to be dismissed. What you're talking about instead is more like the American West gold panning. It's people with sieves going through alluvial sands, and maybe, if they're lucky, they get a natural diamond fragment. So very early on in Indian culture, with this rich legacy of minerals that you have in this country, India becomes the great sort of superpower of the jewellery world very, very early on in its history. And that means that you get not only a lot of export of Indian stones uh, and, great, and merchants coming from all over the world to buy them, it also means you get a huge amount of literature. Uh, and by the time of the Bhagavad Puran, uh, written down probably in the first century, but representing much older currents of stories, you get the story of the Siamantica gem. Uh, and in this image, you'll see uh, Krishna, uh, obviously the blue character in the center of the picture, uh, being given the Siamantica gem, which is this glowing stone, uh, by uh, his brother-in-law. And he, in turn, is about to give it to the king uh, of Dwarka, who's the, 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 the king sitting under the umbrella in the center of the picture. Uh, and uh, uh, this story is important because it's the first outing of this idea which reappears in Indian literature, then passes on to British literature in the form of the Moonstone, and finally ends up in sort of Hollywood movies like Indiana Jones, the idea of the cursed gem. And the Siamantica gem, which is the stone of the sun god Surya. Um, again, interesting whether the link with Surya was one of the reasons why Ranjit Singh chose to give this uh, stone to Puri and to Arissa, uh, also associated with Krishna. Um, so the, the, the stone passes from uh, the king of Dwarka to his brother, who takes it out on a hunting expedition where a whole series of unfortunate events unfold. The brother is killed by a lion, who in turn is killed by a bear, who turns out to be a bear deity. When Krishna goes into the forest to look for it, uh, he battles with this bear. They, as they're both uh, demigods, they, uh, they battle for days without any victory, and eventually the bear god um, bows down and acknowledges Krishna Lord. He gets his, his stone back, he gives it to his father-in-law, only for the father-in-law to be killed. And in this picture, you can see that the head has been detached from the body of the figure lying recumbent on that bed. 
Uh, blood is spurting from him. You get a second image of it above the first bed, just to make the point uh, that uh, sort of blood is separate. You can see the robber with a sword outstretched. You can see the women in the top register screaming and pulling their hairs out, and one woman uh, who's the wife running out of the right-hand bottom register of the picture. And so, again, you get this idea that wherever this stone goes, trouble follows. And because the historical Koh-i-Noor created quite as much dissension and bloodshed as it did, people began in the 19th century to associate the Siamantica gem with the Koh-i-Noor. And the two came to be regarded as the same stone. So in ancient India, you have a hierarchy of ancient stones. They're very important um, as demarcations of status. Uh, in ancient India, very few clothes were worn. Uh, look at this Apsara now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. You have, you often, both men and women were half naked, uh, their top half uncovered. Uh, and uh, one of the only demarcators of status in the absence of clothing was jewellery. Uh, and people would, would, there was strong hierarchies of which stone an individual could wear. Uh, and only a Maharaja or a Vizier could wear diamonds. They were the top rank of diamonds. Uh, and so this dancing Apsara probably would not have been allowed to wear diamonds in the, in the scheme of, uh, of early India. Uh, she would have been relegated to wearing pearls and sapphires and less precious stones. Um, now, as so often in Indian history, uh, the Mughals come in and bring a quite different understanding of the world. And for the Mughals, they liked diamonds. They were very fond of diamonds indeed, but it wasn't their top stone. For them, red stones of light were the top rank of stone in the Persianate world. And so what they like is rubies um, and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, spinels from Afghanistan, from Badakhshan. They were considered by the Mughals to be the most important stone in that uh, gemology. And so you get a... Again, as always with, with this period of history, as the moguls bring in one stream of ideas, whether it's musical or culinary uh, or grammatical or language, uh, and uh, it, you, you find this gradual merging of the two currents. Uh, and uh, the moguls, over their time, become obsessed with gemology. And one of the most common ways of depicting the moguls in their portraits is holding uh, a, a, a turban jewel which in time came to be a mark of status. And when you conferred a governorship on someone, you would, uh, as a mark of office, you'd hand, hand a turban jewel. And this is what is happening in this picture. Uh, Jahangir uh, is passing to uh, his brother-in-law, Asaf Khan, Nur Jahan's brother, a turban jewel uh, as a mark of office. And uh, Shah Jahan, seen here as the young Prince Karam, before he came to power, um, was of all the, uh, the moguls the most obsessed with jewels. And there are wonderful stories about him. There's one Portuguese story by a friar who came to Agra. And he describes uh, a banquet in the Red Fort, which he was watching through a lattice. And he said the most beautiful and sensual dancing girls in the world were brought in. Uh, uh, and these girls were brought in gyrating saucily in front of the emperor, but the emperor's eyes did not rise once to look at them because he'd just been given by Asaf Khan a tray of fine jewels uh, from Badakhshan, from Afghanistan. And his eyes remained the whole meal on these gorgeous stones and was pushing them around. And one of the things that Jahangir likes most about Prince Karam, as you know, he had a, a, a troubled relationship with his son. One of the things he most admires in his son is his aesthetic appreciation of jewels. And he praises over and over again at the Nauruz ceremony when, you're, uh, when the, the moguls were weighed against precious stones in public. Um, uh, it was the opportunity for senior governors and officials to gift every Nauruz on the 20th and 21st of March, um, gift stones to the emperor and so raise their rank. And it was a very straight transaction. In some ways, not unlike uh, uh, modern politics in some countries, uh, where you give a large, valuable gift and your rank is raised. 
Uh, I'm sure it would never happen in the uh, ERISA uh, administration in any way, but uh, in some more benighted parts of the country, I believe that it has been known to happen. And um, the, the, so these, you, you come in, you would give Jahangir or, or Prince Karam a large diamond from Bihar or Golconda or a sapphire or whatever it was, and in return your mansab would be increased from 5,000 horse to 10,000 horse. Uh, and uh, and that was that was uh, Jahangir records this every Nowruz in his diary, and you have these long lists of all the presents, the diamonds that he's been given. As a result of which, by the time Prince Karam came to the throne as Shah Jahan, the Mughals had the greatest collection of jewels in world history. The Red Fort in Delhi was literally groaning with vault after vault of diamonds, sapphires, pearls, and everything else, uh, which had been you know, initially plundered by the sultans, passed on to the moguls, then uh, later as the moguls creep into the Deccan and start conquering the mines, begin to amass in very large numbers in Delhi. And Shah Jahan was always very much aware that architecture and aesthetics and beauty, while a wonderful end in themselves, and the moguls were obviously obsessed with aesthetics, they also realized that these were very important public ways of proclaiming status. When Shah Jahan builds the Taj, he's not just building a monument to love, as the tour guides will tell you. He's also saying, we are this spectacular dynasty. This is what we can do. We are the legitimate sovereigns of Hindustan. And seeing his enormous jewel collection, shortly after building the Taj, he builds this, which is the most expensive piece of furniture ever made in the history of the world. It is, of course, the peacock throne, named after the two peacocks that you'll see on the top of the uh, roof of the, uh, of the kiosk. And uh, Shah Jahan basically put into this one object the cream of all the greatest jewels in this collection, which had been built up over six generations of Mughal rule and, uh, and uh, everything that the sultans had collected before them. And it was modeled on the description of the throne of Solomon in the Quran. And what it's trying to say is we are the legitimate rulers here. We are not just magnificent. We haven't just got perfect taste. But we, like Solomon, rule with justice. We are God's appointed uh, rulers. And so this is a highly political piece of art. It is a didactic uh, art piece of art which proclaims majesty, legitimacy, and justice. And any Muslim of the period with an education looking at this would immediately recognize, as soon as they saw the peacocks on the roof, the reference in the Quran to King Solomon's uh, throne. So this became the symbol of Mughal rule. And people talked about the peacock throne um, uh, as people talk about, I don't know, Racecourse Road today or, uh, or Delhi uh, today as a, as a kind of synonym for power, for the center of things. And it remained with the Mughals through Aurangzeb right through to Muhammad Shah Rangila, whose great, most unfortunate, uh, he had a very happy time with his courtesans and his music and everyone until Nadir Shah came to stay. Now, Nadir Shah was the opposite of Muhammad Shah Rangila. Muhammad Shah Rangila, aesthetic, loved the arts, totally uninterested in ruling, even less interested in military matters. Um, Nadir Shah was this aggressive, self-made man from the steppe near, between Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, and he had invented or he'd utilized the latest military technology. And um, he brought something called the swivel gun, which I suppose in a modern analogy was the F-16 to the old cavalry armies, which were the MiG, uh, the 1950s MiG of their day. And um, again, you find this thing which you, know, you could draw contemporary parallels with, with um, aggressive militaristic rulers to the east of here having the latest military technology, and India let it, letting itself deploy less modern weaponry against it. And this comes with fatal effect uh, in 1739, when Nadir Shah brings only 160,000 troops from Persia and defeats an Indian army of 1.5 million men, possibly the largest army ever put into the field in the history of India. And 
what happens is that the Indian troops, the Mughal heavy, heavy cavalry in their armour, are lured out of their fortifications on the field of Karnal, and they charge the Persians. There are very few of them. Uh, and they, uh, they see this small force, so they charge, they take the defensive. At the last minute, the, Mo the Persian heavy cavalry, sorry, light cavalry, part like a curtain, revealing this line of swivel guns. And the swivel guns are supported on tripods on the horse. They're like a precursor of a tank. And they are thick gazelles that fire an armor-piercing slug that can go through any Mughal armor. Half an hour later, the cream of Mughal chivalry lie dead on the ground. And it's all over. Mahabir Shah Rangila, a gentleman, accepts the invitation of Nadia Shah to dinner to discuss what to do at the end of this confrontation. Idiotic, because he arrives in the Persian camp and the Persian guards close around him. And at the end of dinner, his bodyguards are disarmed. And it's announced that he's staying in the Persian camp as the guest of Nadir Shah. A week later, Nadir Shah just bypasses the remains of the Mughal army, a million men sitting, starving in their cantonment, and marches with their emperor into Delhi. A month later, he leaves with everything the Mughals have collected over six generations, including the peacock throne. And it's only when he puts these jewels on display in Herat, now in Afghanistan, uh, for public display, that we get the first historical reference to the Kohinoor. The only firm, clear reference from this date, 1740, when a Persian chronicler called Muhammad Marvi Yazdi mentions that the, the, the diamond, known, the great diamond known as the Kohinoor, is the eye of the peacock on the top of the peacock throne. There is not a single definite reference to the Kohinoor in any Mughal source. Largely because the Mughals weren't that interested in diamonds. When the Persian, sorry, when the Mughal chroniclers describe the peacock throne, what they pick, pick out for emphasis is the spinels and the rubies, the red stones, which is what they liked. And so uh, what you find is that subsequent histories mirror back onto descriptions of large diamonds, the name Kohinoor. So you'll read, for example, that Babur took a very large diamond off the Raja of Gwalior when he took Agra uh, after the Battle of Panipat. Subsequent historians have said this is the Kohinoor. It may be or it may not be. There were many very large Mughal diamonds. And what we forget is that they are still distributed around the world. The largest of all was always the Daryanoor, which is still sitting in Tehran, in Bank Meli. Uh, no one here knows about the Darya Noor, but it's larger than the Kohinoor. Larger than the Kohinoor, too, is another Mughal diamond known as the Great Mughal Diamond, which the, uh, the jeweler Tavernier saw uh, when he went to see Aurangzeb. That is now known as the Orlov Diamond and is sitting in the scepter of uh, Catherine the Great in the Kremlin. Again, a great Indian diamond looted by Nadir Shah, like the Kohinoor, one that's completely forgotten here. So why is it that we now, or everyone in this room knows the Kohinoor, but how many, I'm just out of interest, how many of you have heard of the Daryanoor? Hands up. How many of you have heard of the Orlov? One. Uh, so these, both these diamonds are larger than the Kohinoor. Why is it that you all know, that, presumably you all, hands up everyone that's heard of the Kohinoor? Kohinoor? <laughs> yeah, so all of you know the Kohinoor. Why is that? The reason is because when the Brits got their hands on it, and we'll be coming to this in a few minutes later, they put it straight into the Great Exhibition and they made it themselves the symbol of the, the, the wealth coming from their empire, which of course has now come back to bite them in the back, so to speak, because it's now the greatest single symbol of colonial loot. So, to continue, from Nadia Shah, the, the Kohinoor makes its way after his assassination into the hands of this man, Ahmed Shah Abdali. According to Afghan sources, the night that Nadia Shah was assassinated, his officers fell on his jewel hoard, which was still in all the packing cases from which he'd brought it back from Delhi. And particularly, they fell on the peacock throne. 
And there's these descriptions of men with daggers and diamonds picking and smashing this thing up uh, in this sort of nightmare uh, that follows the assassination of the ruler. Everyone is trying to steal everything they can get their hands on. Uh, but the only man who remains loyal is this man, Ahmed Shah Abdali, who guards the dead Nadir Shah's harem. And according to Afghan sources, there may have been a different version of events if the women's voices had, had survived. But according to the Afghan version of events, the morning after this rape and pillage, the grateful queen of Nadir Shah, Chuki, gives Ahmed Shah Abdali the Kohinoor and the Timur Ruby, which Nadir Shah had taken down from the peacock throne and had started to wear as a bazuband on his two arms. Kohinoor on one side, Timur Ruby on the other. So it was in his room still when the assassination took place. It was not part of the peacock throne. So whether or not that is the truth, it is certain that, uh, that Ahmed Shah Durrani got his hands on those two stones. And the following day, he rode off with his, uh, his fellow Pashtuns to Kandahar, where he uses these two stones as collateral to found a new country, Afghanistan. And it is literally using those two stones that he gathers his, he gets money lent by bankers to gather troops to create the empire which will replace the empire of Nadir Shah, the Durrani Empire. And of course, as you all know from your Indian history, the Durrani Empire spreads over Central Asia into Persia, but most famously here, it is the Durranis who come down and defeat the Marathas at the Battle of Panipat uh, in uh, 1761, thus annihilating the Maratha army and leaving a vacuum of power into which the British East India Company will come in the next phase of Indian history. So, Ahmed Shah Durrani has this stone. He doesn't live to enjoy it very long. Again, anyone that has the Kohinoor uh, seems to come to a very sticky end. In the case of Ahmed Shah Abdali, he has a tumour on his nose, which begins to take over his face. Even as he's fighting Panipat, he's wearing half his face under a kind of helmet of silver studded with jewels, like Robocop, because his face is being eaten away. And according to one source, maggots were falling through this mask into his food as he ate. So this victorious warlord who has conquered everything and destroyed the mighty Maratha army is being slowly killed himself and defeated by disease, by this tumour. And shortly after Panipat, he goes back to Afghanistan and he dies and his empire disintegrates, leaving the Sikhs to take over the Punjab and the rise of the Sikh Empire, which will replace it. So the Kohinoor goes from Amir Shah Durrani to his son Timur Shah, who marries uh, into the Mughal line. Uh, the sister of Shah Alam marries uh, Timur Shah and gives birth to this man, who is not Gimli from Lord of the Rings, although he does look like it rather, uh, but instead he, it is Shah Shujar al-Mulk, uh, the last of the Durrani uh, emperors. He is defeated in battle by one of his own cousins. He flees into a Kashmir where he is put into prison by um, a, one of his own noblemen and shoved in a dungeon uh, in the fort in Srinagar. His widow, however, not widow, his wife, um, escapes to this man, to Ranjit Singh, and makes a deal and says, look, Ranjit, if you can get my husband out of prison, I've got a little present for you. And she says, I'm not telling you where it is, but I've got the Kohinoor. She knows that Ranjit Singh loves jewels. And he agrees a deal. And indeed, he takes Kashmir at this period. Uh, and uh, he conquers Kashmir. He brings Shah Shuja back to Lahore. And then he says, where's my diamond? Shah Shuja says, I didn't say you could have my diamond. So Ranjit Singh tortures Shah Shuja's son in front of him until he promises to give up the stone. And that's how it passes for the Durranis back into an Indian power, the Ranjit Singh uh, of Lahore, the great Sikh ruler of the Khalsa. Ranjit Singh loves the Kohinoor, and it's at this phase that we begin to hear a great deal about the Kohinoor. It's the first time the Kohinoor actually comes to the fore. He wears it on his arm on all state occasions. When British travellers come to see him, when the Governor General, uh, uh, Lord Auckland, holds Durbar's, Ranjit Singh is always wearing the Kohinoor. And the Brits who don't know about the oil of diamond in 
the Kremlin, the former great Mughal diamond, and they don't know about the Darya Noor in Tehran, talk about it being the biggest diamond in the world. It isn't, but it is the, the biggest diamond which they are coming into contact with. And it's at this phase that you begin to get the legend of the Kohinoor growing. So Ranjit Singh um, has elaborate security measures for the Kohinoor. He has it kept in Govingar, which is his fortress. He uh, has a string of 40 camels whenever he moves it, each carrying an identical pannier, and only the man running the convoy knows which pannier the Kohinoor is being kept in. Uh, so that if there's a raid on it, they have to take 40 camels hostage rather than one. Uh, so when he dies, uh, he is worried that he's, uh, all the people he's killed, he's worried about his soul, and he starts giving away his possessions. He gives away his saddles, his horses, and specifically, he gives the Kohinoor to the Jagannath Temple in Puri. Why is that? Probably because of the link with the Siamantika gem. Siamantika gem is associated with Krishna, and hence the link with Puri. Uh, so whatever reason, he, uh, he, a Sikh based in Lahore, decides to send this diamond to Orissa. A long way away. And very interesting that the Jagannath Temple in this period was as famous as uh, uh, that of all the... Uh, the Krishna temples and Vishnu temples in India, it is, uh, it is uh, Jagannath that he wants to give it to. It never goes there. Uh, the, as he's lying with a stroke, the treasurer hides it, and it only reappears when uh, Ranjit Singh is dead, cremated, and his son Karak Singh, up on the top uh, left, uh, receives the, uh, the Kohinoor uh, from the treasurer, uh, as the mark of his office. Now, uh, Karak Singh uh, inherits the diamond, but he is a blockhead. Unlike his brilliant, scheming, genius father, Karak Singh is a drunk, uh, a, a lush, uh, a, uh, a, a player, uh, and a blockhead. Uh, and his courtiers almost immediately decide to plot a coup. Uh, and, and, and the easiest way to, uh, to perform a coup in those days uh, was to poison your leader's food. Uh, I don't want to give anyone any ideas here in any way, uh, but uh, they, they put white lead into his food and Karak Singh begins to bleed and to, his joints begin to ache uh, and um, he uh, dies in horrible pain six months later. His son, now Nihal Singh, top right, takes over but lasts only one day with the Kohinoor in his possession. And uh, now Nihal Singh um, is coming back from his father's cremation. Um, so now Nihal Singh is coming back from Karak Singh's cremation when uh, a masonry arch that he's passing under collapses mysteriously on top of him uh, and his head is smashed in. Uh, so he's taken to the palace. He isn't quite dead, but certainly by the time that the doctor arrives, he's totally, his head is smashed in. So someone's had a second go at him by all accounts as he lies in his stretcher dying in the Lahore fort. He has, a young wid he has a young widow that he's left pregnant behind him. So his mother, bottom left, um, locks the doors of the fort and waits for this widow to give birth, hoping that it will be a boy. It is a boy, but it's still born. Uh, so uh, 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 his widow um, is then besieged by bottom right, the man spreader, the kind of man you don't want to sit next to on the Delhi Metro, uh, with this sort of wide, uh, sort of mansplaining, man spreading, sort of gym going physique, uh, Sher Singh. Um, he uh, besieges the Lahore fort, uh, and eventually a uh, compromise is reached. Uh, now Nihal Singh's mother agrees to go off to the country and is allowed to have her freedom uh, if she hands over the Kohinoor and the fort. So she goes into retirement. She thinks she's fine. She isn't, as anyone who touches the Kohinoor soon finds. Uh, she, she's having her hair brushed by her ladies' maids a month later when they put down the hair brushes, pick up a pair of bricks and pound her skull in. Um, and Cher Singh, the, the, the band spreader bottom right, is left in charge, but not for long, uh, because his two cousins come and bring him a present. The present is a, a new Swiss British invention, the double barreled shotgun. They say, you're a great hunter, Cher Singh, I bet you'd like one of these, pam, and it goes off in his face, and then pam, another barrel goes off in his chest. That's the end of Cher Singh. 
leaving at the end of this very rapid roulette wheel of death one man standing and he isn't even a man. This is the young cherubic survivor from this bloodbath, Dulip Singh. And Dulip Singh uh, is this beautiful cherub boy uh, and he is left in charge of this mutinous, fractious Sikh culture. The real uh, woman running the affairs is his mother, uh, 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 Rani Jindan. Rani Jindan, as you can see from this wall painting, is a huge and spectacularly beautiful Punjab Punjabi Therni, uh, but a very low caste. She is the daughter of the kennel keeper. So while she is as, as ruthless and as tough as anyone in the, in the Sikh army, uh, she is not an acceptable regent as far as the Khalsa is concerned. And they begin to plot with their neighbors, and some of them begin to plot with the next door neighbors in the shape of Lord Dalhousie. So there then follow two Sikh wars, which are won, as so often in the case of British history, not by might of arms, but by bribes, um, uh, treachery, and the shenanigans of various sorts. Uh, and Lord Dalhousie, who is the sort of Boris Johnson of his day, this sort of old Etonian um, schemer and, uh, uh, and general uh, uh, troublemaker, uh, takes over, defeats the Sikhs at the Battle of Gudranwala, marches into Lahore in 1849, and without consulting his bosses, who are the East India Company directors, in the Treaty of Lahore, on the third article of the treaty, he puts down that the diamond known as the Kohinoor shall go to Her Majesty the Queen. Now, this pisses off his employers, who rather want to have the Kohinoor themselves. Uh, and he's not employed by the Crown, he's employed by the directors of the East India Company, which is a corporate entity. It's rather like, I don't know, I suppose uh, Bill Gates or whoever it is that runs Apple now, suddenly finding that one of their employees has given the, you know, the, 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 the plan of the iPad, I don't know, something to, uh, to uh, Trump, rather than... Uh, anyway, I'm, analogy is getting spiraling out of control here. But uh, the, uh, anyway, so the diamond is to go to Her Majesty. And the problem is getting it there. So Dalhousie leaves it in the care of Sir John Lawrence, who again is an ICS officer in charge of the Punjab, one of the great administrators of his day, evangelical Christian, couldn't care less about diamonds or art, much more interested in sort of feeding the Punjab and irrigation channels and this sort of thing, uh, and promptly forgets about the Kohinoor. So when the kind of courier from FedEx or DHL, whoever it is, turns up and says, well, where's the Kohinoor? We have to take it to London. He does that thing. You know when you lose your mobile phone or you can't find your credit card? He can't find the koh -Nor. He's put it somewhere. He can't remember where. So he you know, does what we all do when we lose our mobile phone, looks under the cushions of the sofa, looks through his old uh, trousers of his suits to find which one he was wearing the day he's lost it. No sign of it. So this is obviously a bit of a problem because this war has just been fought uh, for this diamond and he's mislaid it. Anyway, luckily his bearer says, oh, you mean that piece of glass? I nearly threw it out, but I put it in a drawer. So eventually the koh is found. He breathes a sigh of relief. It goes down to Bombay. It's quietly put on a steamer called the Medea. One day out of Bombay, the first sailor on the Medea goes down with cholera. Then a second, then a third. Cholera is broken out. By the time it's got to Mauritius, half the crew is dead. Uh, they try and land at Mauritius to, uh, to take on medicine, but the, uh, the governor of Mauritius threatens to shell the steamer uh, as a plague ship if it lands, so they carry on. They hit a typhoon as they cross the equator. By the time they get into British waters three months later, there are only ten men left on the entire steamer. Uh, but they make it into British waters. As the steamer enters British waters, uh, the Prime Minister is thrown from his horse on Primrose Hill in London and uh, Peel, the Prime Minister, is, uh, breaks his neck and dies. Uh, on the day that the koh is sent to Queen Victoria, and this is literally true, uh, and verifiably so, however you interpret it, um, a madman jumps out of the crowd outside Buckingham Palace, hits Queen Victoria over the head with a gold-tipped cane. And so when she receives the koh that evening, her diary has about six paragraphs about her black eye and this madman who'd attacked her, and only three lines on the koh oh, and the koh arrived in the evening. Um, so it's a little bit of an anticlimax, but the koh continues to work its dark magic. And uh, everyone in Britain has now heard of the koh -Nor. So the following year, 
in an effort to try and uh, uh, drum up publicity for the empire, Queen Victoria announces the great, uh, hang on, I have to wind forward a bit, the great exhibition of 1851. And the Koh-i-Noor is the central exhibit. And this is the moment that the Koh-i-Noor enters the popular lexicon. By the end of 1851, there are restaurants called the koh i -Noor. There's a pencil company called the koh i -Noor. The koh i has been on the front page of the Times, the Illustrated London News. The whole world knows about the koh i -Noor. But the koh i -Noor does not behave itself at the, at the exhibition. It's put initially into a cage designed by Mr. Chubb of Chubb Locks, uh, a, a high security cage where the, the diamond disappears into the bowels of this thing if, it, if someone tries to put their hands through the cage. But it doesn't uh, glitter enough. By this stage, people are used to brilliant cuts, which are the, the modern way of cutting diamonds, cut with a, a modern diamond cutting equipment. And they're used to shiny diamonds. But the koh i -Noor is cut in a mogul rose cut, which is the old-fashioned way of cutting a diamond. Um, you can see the, here, the, which, uh, on the central picture is the old cut of the koh i -Noor. And... Prince Albert then tries to, he says, because, because the Crystal Palace, where the Great Exhibition is, is obviously a great big greenhouse, and he thinks that no one, it's not glittering because it's not sufficiently, not properly lit, he builds a little black tent and uh, tries to arrange mirrors and gas lamps uh, so that it will shine properly. Uh, but all he actually has managed to do is invent the first sauna in Britain, because as soon as all these women in the great big Victorian busks walk into this tent, they faint because of the heat. It's already in a greenhouse, and it's the middle of summer. So one after one, there's these long, long queues for about two miles down the Crystal Palace to see the koh i -Noor. And, one, and then these sort of ladies are being pulled out on stretchers the far side of the tent. It's a disaster. Um, so they decide to recut the koh i -Noor, although... All the gemologists in London say it's got a flaw in the centre, and if they cut it, it won't work. There'll be a terrible problem. You can't cut the koh they say. But they find one very skilled Jewish diamond cutter in Amsterdam who's brought in, and they say to him, cut the diamond, and he says, OK. It starts off with a kind of celebrity cut in the Haymarket with the Duke of Wellington, the victor of Waterloo, being pulled out of retirement and asked to do the first cut. Uh, and, uh, of course, as anything with the koh i -Noor, the, Duke of, the Duke of Wellington dies three days later. Um, uh, and uh, uh, do you sure you really want this back here, guys? <laughs> uh, and uh, anyway, it's a disaster, the cut. The koh i -Noor goes into the cut at 195 metric carats, and it comes out of the cut at 95 metric carats. It's now shiny and symmetrical. It's the diamond that exists today in the Tower of London, but it's lost over half its weight. Because to cut it, they have to cut against the floor. And what happens if you do that with a diamond is that it effectively reverts to... It's, it's just carbon diamond. It's like coal. And, uh, and it just goes up in smoke. The heat becomes so intense if you cut against the grain of a diamond that it just incinerates. So what's left at the end of this cutting process is a 95-carat diamond which in the modern scheme of things is not even in the top 100 diamonds in the world. However, it remains, of course, now the greatest example and most famous example of colonial loot. And onto this one small inch-long diamond, no larger than a large hen's egg, has been put, in a sense, all the sins of colonialism. It's become a symbol everything that the British took, not only from this country, but from around the world. Which is why, when you go to the Tower of London today, um, the, the British authorities have had to put a sort of airport-style conveyor belt running along the side of the, uh, the, 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 the case where the stone is kept, because it's surrounded by Desis, not just you lot, but also Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Afghans, and Iranians, shouting, chore, chore, loot, loot, at this thing. 
And it is a very amusing thing, I have to say, to, to, if you ever are in London, to, to go to this. It's the only place in London you can see Daisy's moonwalking backwards, shouting expletives at each other across this conveyor belt. Uh, like some, doing some Michael Jackson imitations as, the, as the, 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 the conveyor belt carries them away and then running back. But they're barking usually at the wrong stone, because in the same case is the Cullinan Diamond, which is the largest diamond in the world. The Cullinan Diamond is the size of a rugby football. It's an enormous, ridiculous lump of diamond, larger than, you know, way larger than any other diamond has ever been. And it's sitting there in the same case. And the daisies are usually shouting at that rather than at the koh i which is this sort of other small little thing sitting in the corner. Anyway, highly recommended. Last time it was put on formal ceremonial display. Um, Queen Victoria wore it, but it's never been worn again by any monarch. And the last time it was seen in public was uh, wind forward, lots of stuff we're not going to have, uh, was when um, the Queen Mother, uh, this is now worn by the, the, co the consort of the, of the monarch, uh, which was Princess Alexandra in this picture, but then became the Queen Mother. Uh, and she wore it, or, or it was on her coffin in Westminster Hall the last time it was seen in ceremonial role at the funeral of the Queen Mother three years ago. Next up will be the coronation of Prince Charles III and Queen Camilla Parker Bowles. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>